Oh, yeah. I think uh, timeliness is the way to go, David. So Great. Uh, OK, I want to reward everybody who um, uh, uh, joined the call on time. <clears throat> so um, Herman Taylor is our speaker today. Herman and I were college classmates, but only because it took me five years to graduate, whereas Herman did it in four. Um, after graduation, Herman attended Harvard Medical School. Then after internship, he joined the, the he made a, uh, a, an atypical move and joined the public health service right after internship, providing uh, primary pediatric and adult uh, care at a community clinic in an underserved area, Liberty, Liberty City, Miami, Florida, that some of you may have heard of. He com then completed his medical residency at UNC and did fellowships in general and interventional cardiology at UAB, where I believe he interacted with, with Larry Dean. He later completed an MPH program at the Harvard School of Public Health. Herman has continued as a, or, or continued as a faculty member at UAB until 1998 when he moved to the University of Mississippi as a professor of medicine, principal investigator, director and steering committee chair of the Jackson Heart Study, which many of you are familiar with. He led the transformation of the Jackson Heart Study into an integrated, broadly collaborative research enterprise that included development of a Jackson Heart Study national network of working groups, and they've been extremely productive. Uh, in 2014, he moved from Mississippi to <clears throat> um, over to Georgia to Morehouse School of Medicine, where he has been professor and director of a multidisciplinary cardiovascular research institute. Herman's received many honors during his career, including the AHA Distinguished Service Award, the Thurgood Marshall Foundation Award of Excellence. He was named as a White House Champion of Change for Prevention and Public Health and has been elected to the National Academy of Medicine. He's testified several times to Congress regarding the Jackson Heart Study. His, his work has been supported by numerous NIH and foundation grants uh, starting in 1991 and continuing through the present. He has more than uh, 200 co-authored peer-reviewed publications, <clears throat> including publications in Nature, Circulation, uh, Jack, American Journal of Human Genetics, um, Blood, and the flagship of the PLOS group, PLOS Genetics. Throughout his career, what I really, one of the many things I admire about Herman is that he's consistently connected some of America's most disadvantaged individuals <clears throat> with efforts to improve their health and their lives. His talk today has the provocative and exciting title toppling the monolithic view of black cardiovascular health and disease. Herman, we're so glad to welcome you um, uh, remotely to Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> David, thank you so very much for that very kind introduction. And uh, it is a great pleasure to be with you virtually. Um, I am really looking forward to this interaction. Uh, it's exciting to see um, all of the uh, Mountain View and other beautiful uh, backgrounds I've uh, seen as we've uh, uh, talked and uh, gotten reacquainted with uh, some, some dear longtime friends. Um, uh, Larry Dean and I uh, just briefly go way back. Uh, he taught me how to use a catheter and uh, it was, a, <clears throat> it was a, a great, a great period in my, in my early uh, cardiology life. So it's, it's good to, uh, to be with you this morning. <clears throat> I'm going to, um, you see my disclosures there. I'm, I'm going today to talk with you um, about a, a very important issue. Oh, and here's my shameless plug, by the way. I'll just leave that up briefly. Uh, it is indeed a shameless plug for a book I put together with uh, Keith Ferdinand and Carlos Rodriguez. Um, as was said, um, we're gonna talk about um, the view of uh, black uh, cardiovascular, more generally health, black health um, uh, writ large, <clears throat> which I think um, to those of you who are uh, in the audience, if I were to ask you to characterize the health of uh, black America, I'm sure that um, 
in your in your mind's eye would uh, emerge a picture uh, that really basically showed uh, people who are living um, with uh, an excess of misery, um, with an excess of morbidity and uh, early death. It would in general be uh, a very uh, concerning picture. And there's certainly reason for that concern. Um, but what I want to entertain uh, for the next few minutes with you is the notion that uh, there is uh, a more complete story to be told. And I, I ask your indulgence as we, as we try to navigate our way through a more complete uh, 360 view of uh, uh, health in African Americans. The, the outline I'll follow in general, I'm going to get the images of those beautiful faces off to a corner here. The outline I'm going to follow is, is uh, fairly straightforward. First, we're going to concede uh, readily and, uh, and emphatically that uh, American race-based health disparities are real, they're pervasive, and they have been persistent over time. There's a bit of a delay in the slide changing, so please uh, bear with us. The last 30 years in particular, and Dr. Roth can attest to this and others in the audience, uh, have been an important era of establishing the severity and extent of race slash ethnicity-based health disparities. And these group comparisons have been uh, fantastic in focusing our attention on these, um, these race determined disparities. And this uh, has been incredibly useful to sharpen our focus on uh, a national urgency, national priority. However, um, these um, fairly consistent reports of uh, disparities in, in just about every disease category uh, can contribute to a monolithically negative view of black health. I believe that uh, black resilience is an important concept that's overlooked, and its study may offer fresh insights. All of us have been um, really amazed at uh, just how dramatically um, the vulnerability of African Americans um, and other groups, I will today focus on African Americans because that's where my work has been focused principally. But we've been amazed at just how dramatically um, race has mattered in uh, the, the uh, ongoing uh, COVID epidemic. And it has been uh, sort of a, a magnifying glass on uh, factors that many of us have been aware of and sort of talking about for the last 30 years. But I think, I think no one now can uh, ignore uh, just how dramatically important um, race has been in this, in this pandemic and how African-Americans along with others have suffered uh, the brunt of the negative uh, impact. Um, while this has provided uh, occasion for epiphany in many corners, I think um, the, the scholarship and the, the knowledge of this uh, situation goes back, goes back quite a ways. W.B. Du Bois at the turn of the 20th century made um, this simple, elegant statement that um, one thing that is expected is a much higher death rate present among Negroes and whites. They have lived in the past under vastly different conditions, and they still live under different conditions. Um, his observations um, are based on uh, really a brilliant uh, for the time study of um, in his words, the Philadelphia Negro population. And it's, it's worth a look if you are, are not familiar with it. <clears throat> now, um, at the same time, at this, in these last few decades, we in cardiology have um, made perhaps somewhat self, in a self-congratulatory way, uh, have um, dubbed these last few decades as somewhat of a golden age. And, and that's not, um, you know, uh, that's not a, uh, just a frivolous uh, claim. I think when you really look at all of the advances that are, are that are arrayed along this annotated graph here, um, and that's this is just a sum um, and uh, a subset, I should say, 
that uh, Drs. Nabel and uh, Brownwell put together a few years ago, uh, you'd have to say that this was indeed a seminal time. And uh, going along with that is the dramatic reduction in death from cardiovascular disease for the nation as a whole. Those of you acquainted with work in disparities, of course, know that the rest of the story is that um, there has been uh, the emergence and the persistence of a huge gap, a huge uh, mortality and morbidity gap that um, this curve, which is now a few years old, but the trends are of the gap persisting are still there. You can see here that over this particular period of time in the state of Mississippi, compared with white men nationally, black men in that state, uh, if you take this point here in 19, approximately 1976, and compare it with, um, nine, with uh, 2005, you see that there uh, actually um, was no substantive change in the cardiovascular mortality for black males in the state. If you look here, the number is approximately 900 for 100,000. If you look here, it's almost identical. So despite a wavering line, um, unstable because it's a relatively small state, but you can see that um, for a generation in Mississippi, nothing essentially happened with black mortality while the golden age of cardiology reaped benefits for uh, white males nationally. Uh, some of this was summarized in this very important landmark report that many of you are aware of, but if not, again, you should acquaint yourself with it because I think in, in, even in the opening letter of what was uh, you know, a very important and uh, I said landmark, groundbreaking, all of those words apply, um, several volume report called Black and Minority Health, the then secretary of HHS, uh, Margaret Heckler, uh, penned these words, Americans were living longer, infant mortality had continued to decline, and the picture looked great overall, but there was a continuing disparity uh, among uh, Black and minorities, and the disparity existed since re records were kept, and she called it an affront to our ideals and what she called the ongoing genius of American medicine. Many things came out of that report that were positive, including uh, a set of uh, priorities um, that um, the lead authors of uh, Dr. Charles Francis and Augustus White, um, <clears throat> but um, helped by a, a large number of national experts in, in uh, black health and mostly cardiologists, set up a, a set of priorities that they thought needed to be attended to right away. And this is in 1994. You can see some of these listed. Um, and all of these really pointed to areas of deficit of data, where we didn't know enough about the African American experience, and that we needed to do something about it. <clears throat> you can see the list here, epidemiology risk factors, prevention, genetics, LVH was cited in particular, and other issues that uh, we just had poor data on and we needed to do something about that. And you can draw a direct line from that to um, uh, what uh, Dr. Dicek mentioned in the opening, my involvement in the Jackson Heart Study. And the, the, here was the National Institutes of Health response to this data deficit. And um, like um, you would expect, um, uh, the lion's share of data emerging from the Jackson Heart Study is indeed focused on risk and the risk uh, that has produced these disparities that we're all so uh, familiar with, and if not familiar, becoming familiar with. Um, some of the um, interesting papers that have emerged, this is just a brief list of the papers on hypertension alone, that one risk factor, one that happens to be particularly prominent among African-Americans. Um, some of the uh, uh, sub-studies looking into other aspects of hypertension, including nocturnal dipping and the impact of social economic position on it, uh, with the um, not surprising finding that 
the lower your socioeconomic status, the more likely dipping does not occur. And with all of the, the consequent risk that non-dipping uh, imposes on people who um, don't have that salutary uh, reset at, at, at night, um, the whole emergence of the, the concept of mask hypertension, which um, uh, basically describes people who, uh, when they sit, sort of the opposite of the white coat, when they sit in the uh, physician's office, their blood pressure um, appears normal, but they go home uh, to elevated uh, blood pressures that, they, that the people are um, reporting by using uh, self-measurement uh, self in their own homes at a time when hopefully things are a little less tense than sitting in an office surrounded by white coats. Um, the Jackson Heart Study has also underscored the growing scholarship that social determinants are really um, a critical and uh, uh, carry more weight in the ultimate health of uh, African-Americans and others um, than many of the things that we tend to focus on as physicians, uh, nurses, and pharmacists, and other people who, who uh, take care of people on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, some of the early studies in, um, of uh, social determinants uh, look at um, things like um, the, the impact of uh, discrimination, for one, on um, blood pressures, um, the, um, the risk gradient um, that is attached to with looking within the African-American population, risk gradient attached to socioeconomic status, and other many, many um, um, areas of social determinants. We also, um, more recently, and this was published just a couple of years ago, 2020, um, the early studies, because of the nature of the Jackson Heart Study uh, being started when those studies or those studies being uh, done very near the, the start of the Jackson Heart Study. We now have longitudinal data that really sort of um, drives the point home again that um, people experiencing discrimination um, do have an enhanced risk for the development of hypertension uh, longi longitudinally. And all of this then again aligns with what we are seeing, what the COVID epidemic has underscored, what you may even see in your clinics, that African-Americans as a group bear an inordinate risk. Now, with that as background, I want, to, want you to consider a case. This is a woman, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, I worked with uh, Dr. Dean in Birmingham, and this is from that time in Birmingham. And here's a woman who uh, was African-American, um, she uh, grew up in that part of the world, exposed to uh, a, a high level of um, toxins in her childhood. She, uh, in fact, her father was uh, <clears throat> a coal miner. And uh, as, a, as a side gig, he sold coal out from underneath his porch. And there was always coal dust in the, um, in the air. Um, she, um, at age, uh, uh, 17, as I recall, this study began smoking and, and smoked a minimum of 30 pack years. Um, she was exposed to asbestos. She married a, a steel worker who every day brought home um, a clothes that um, were uh, very possibly laden with asbestos fibers. Um, she washed those clothes. She breathed those fibers along with him. Um, at uh, age 42, she had a total abdominal hysterectomy and had her ovaries removed as well, another cardiovascular risk. She was exposed chronically to the Southern diet. She eventually developed type 2 diabetes. And if during her lifetime, um, she lived through very uh, worst part, I think, of um, the, uh, the challenges that that state had with uh, civil rights being an African-American woman, woman, you know, she was an adult when dogs were attacking children in the park um, uh, during uh, demonstrations. But that, that uh, very public expression of uh, race, racism um, was really the tip of the iceberg for her. Given all of these stresses, given all of these classical risk factors, 
If I were to tell you that she she died of a heart attack or stroke at age 55, you would not be surprised in the least. She lived to be 92 and was intact uh, mentally um, and in every other way, driving until she was 88 and so on. Um, and at first glance, obviously this sounds anecdotal. Yeah, there are outliers everywhere. But I think what's important is that um, we recognize that it, it does happen, it can happen, and she's not alone. If you look at some other um, signals of resilience despite uh, adversity, uh, and, and we're focusing on African-Americans now because I think African-Americans, uh, I think I can get consensus that African-Americans have as a group uh, suffered inordinately in this regard. Uh, but if you look at them, that you can see that uh, there are examples that bear attention. Um, in the Jackson Heart Study, 80% of the men, actually, I think it's closer to 85% of the men in the study, by the time they reached age 60, had a diagnosis of hypertension. Now, that's a terrible outcome, and that's a disparity. Uh, however, we never really focus on that 20% who, despite having every reason to become hypertensive by the time they're 60, avoid it. What is behind that? What is behind that, for lack of a better term, resilience or resistance to the development of hypertension? Um, the Dallas Heart Study uh, participants um, uh, who were Black, uh, among them were um, uh, about 100 and I think 30 that had an extraordinarily low level of LDL and had very low cardiovascular disease um, and it, uh, disease rates. Um, and the, um, the genetic analysis of those individuals was part of the chain of events that led to the development of uh, blockbuster drugs in the PCSK9 category. So that, Evidence of resilience has uh, implications not only for African Americans, but beside, but aside from that particular group, others are now benefiting from that observation of this particularly resilient group. Um, while uh, APOL1 is a very high risk for the development of CKD, 40% um, of the patients with that uh, risk allele did not have progression to the composite renal outcome in the ASK study. And there's a curious um, observation that has been um, in the literature for, for decades that among the elderly African-Americans, once they reach a ripe old age, actually do um, have at least as good longevity as their white counterparts, perhaps better. So all of these are interesting signals. And here's an older one. If we go all the way back to the uh, Evans County study, which was done uh, admittedly back in the 60s, uh, what was observed was that coronary heart disease prevalence for the Blacks in that county were um, four times lower than among the white counterparts. And this, um, in the face of higher rates of hypertension and higher rates of smoking. That has been um, thought of in many ways. Some people say, well, because the social, the, the social order in uh, rural Georgia in the 60s was so radically polarized, that is that the people who uh, had privilege, who owned shops, who um, had, had the opportunity to access excess, if you will, that contributed to cardiovascular disease were generally white, while the people who were living a much more rugged in physical environment, often sharecroppers were black, that that was the explanation. Again, I submit these are interesting signals that I think are incompletely understood. So James Baldwin puts the question in a different way, uh, <clears throat> being an, an acute observer of society, uh, says, um, you know, the wonder in summary is not that so many have difficulties or in his words are ruined, but the wonder is that so many survive. So we were interested in this question. And in Atlanta, we thought we had a perfect laboratory of a very diverse African-American population. And we undertook to look specifically within the African-American population for signs of resilience despite um, 
difficulties in, um, uh, in life as well as in cardiovascular risk factor profiles. And uh, here are some of the reasons we thought that Atlanta would be the place to do this. Um, and uh, if you didn't know, uh, Atlanta has long been regarded as a black Mecca. And uh, this is, and here's the documentation of that status from Ebony Magazine back in 1971. But it was uh, as recently as the final episode of Blackish uh, brought up as a place that African Americans love to migrate to. And there are reasons for that. We can talk about this later. Um, we thought it was perfect for us to launch something we call Mecca, which is the Morehouse and Emory um, Cardiovascular Center for um, Health Equity, which I'm pleased to direct along with my good friend, uh, Dr. Arshed Kaumi. And um, coming out of our early work here, which I'll uh, talk about for the next few slides, is um, an exploration that looked at resilience as a multi-level phenomenon. Um, in some ways, given everything I told you earlier, being Black um, appears to be a high risk, a high risk condition for cardiovas cardiovascular difficulties. Um, but there are instances and signals that there are people who somehow avoid or overcome that risk. So we thought to look at individual levels as well as contextual levels. So on the individual front, we looked at behavioral, psychological, and biological aspects of, um, of this question. And we looked at um, neighborhood and higher level, um, uh, higher orders of um, possible risk that might be a part of, um, for lack of better terminology, we'll call the exposal. This gives a brief uh, outline of the three projects that we undertook. And, um, and in each instance, we had uh, separate PIs focusing on these particular approaches to the question of resilience. And um, in each of these were uh, headed by uh, PIs from Morehouse and Emory. Um, Peter Baltris and Tanae Lewis led the population project and our, I should not use the past tense, although uh, the initial funding is, is uh, passed, the work still continues and we're looking for additional funding to enhance what we have laid the groundwork for. Um, and this gives you, a, again, an overview of the location. You can see that's North uh, West Georgia. That's all the Atlanta metropolitan area where approximately 2 million African-Americans live. Um, and what we looked at were three, to, to look at the question of community resilience. We looked at three cardiovascular outcome metrics, um, mortality, ED visits, and um, hospitalization, all, uh, all around cardiovascular uh, disease and death. We compared these rates um, in order to uh, identify communities first, uh, identify communities that were either uh, areas that seem to promote cardiovascular resilience among black residents or contributed or contribute to poor health. We try to get at the factors that contribute to the, the resilience as well as risk, both at the census track and individual levels and examine the relationship between these and Life Simple 7 as a measure of uh, cardiovascular health. So uh, some of the, um, early publications looked at first whether or not we could actually identify um, this type of variance in risk. And um, of course, when we tried to find communities that were high and low risk, that at first pass was easy and it all seemed to be pointing to SES. So uh, when black income was dis different than black outcome in terms of cardiovascular disease and death and so forth were dramatically different. So here, the unexpected um, breakdown here of um, different rates in these resilient and at-risk census tracts. And census tracts approximate neighborhoods. Then it's not, a, not perfect, but it's a, it's a nice proxy for neighborhoods. But this, not, this is not the question we were trying to answer. I, I think most of us here recognize that 
um, uh, socioeconomic status is very tightly come to disease out, uh, tightly tied to disease outcome. Um, so our statisticians then um, uh, undertook to try and normalize and come up with uh, communities that were actually very close in median income for the families, but quite different in these outcomes of mortality rate, ED visit rate, and admission rate. And what you see here are the communities that we identified across the Atlanta metro. Um, red being those that we call at risk and the, the uh, blue being those that we call uh, resilient, where unexpectedly low rates of cardiovascular disease outcomes, uh, negative outcomes were discovered. And you can see that in many cases, these places geographically are contiguous one with the other, but with fairly dramatic differences in cardiovascular disease and death rates. So going into these communities then to try to figure out what was going on at, on the community level, on the contextual level, was um, a primary aim of the population study. And we used uh, to assess um, the perception of these neighborhoods by the people um, who lived there. Um, some fairly standard uh, questionnaires getting to things like the uh, aspects of community life and contextual existence that are listed here. Aesthetic quality, wealth, environment, safety, and uh, other items that are part of the context. And we use something called the neighborhood health scale overall to uh, give us a summative view of what life was like in these, these environments. Uh, here's some sample questions for aesthetic quality. In my neighborhood, the buildings and homes are well maintained. Um, I won't go through all of these, but you can see um, samples of the types of questions that were asked from people from these very different uh, environments. We also wanted to know something about the actual individuals who live there, not just the perceptions or the data from census tracts that, that describe these areas, but what do the residents actually feel and experience and, and who, um, who they are in these dimensions, whether they have ex experienced discrimination, whether they uh, have uh, something termed environmental mastery or a feeling of sense of control and not that things are happening to them, but they have a role in how, thing, how their life is going. Purpose in life, optimism, a specific resilience scale, as well as symptoms and signs of depression. And here's some of the sample questions that looked at individual uh, measures. And what we found is an array of um, expected results, such as things like aesthetic quality and safety mattered and healthy food access, uh, but also very interesting on a personal level, the um, notion of environmental mastery, purpose in life, and optimism were very uh, prominent in our. Uh, initial survey. Now, the initial survey was also augmented by some in-person, in-clinic interviewing, which uh, gave slightly different emphasis to the uh, outcomes that were important, and we'll get to that in a moment. So looking at individual characteristics and social context, these results are important. Um, looking at the likelihood that a given neighborhood environment would produce or would contain individuals who had ideal cardiovascular health using the Life Simple 7 as the, as the outcome. We found that uh, neighborhoods characterized by, by two things in particular, social cohesion and activity with neighbors. It's an interesting set of, um, of descriptors to emerge from this array not that these were not significant, that is aesthetic quality, walking, safety, food, access, but the ones that achieve statistical significance for predicting good cardiovascular health by the Life Simple 7 score were these two characteristics. And if we broke it down further and looked at the contributing components to Life Simple 7 that seem to be driving the association, exercise, diet, and BMI were the most prominent in affecting that, that outcome and that association. Similarly with activity and neighbors, 
exercise, diet, and BMI. So it's important to, to observe then that positive environment, like activity with neighbors, there's a social environment, activities with neighbors, and a sense of social cohesion matter. On the individual level, all of these measures um, were associated with improved cardiovascular health and likelihood of ideal cardiovascular health. And I think it is important to, to note them individually. So, um, so the composite was certainly very salutary, but also positive scores on environmental mastery, purpose in life, optimism, resilient coping, and low levels of depressive symptoms all predicted better cardiovascular health in the given context. And if we took these uh, data together, that is uh, data on the individuals as well as on the context, an interesting uh, uh, set of data emerged. And looking at uh, mean life simple seven scores, and recall that um, uh, an increase in one level of Life Simple 7 scores, at least according to the Framingham study, is associated with something like a 17% improvement in um, uh, cardiovascular outcomes as measured by hard events. Um, we see that if the individual measures of resilience, the ones that we um, uh, used in this study, if the individual measures of resilience and the, the measures of neighborhood resilience were both on the, the low end. And of course that produced the lowest uh, mean scores. Those scores were improved uh, substantially by the point estimate was improved substantially by having good neighborhood environment, even if the person's individual levels of resilience as measured by our assessments were low. Uh, however, a, a statistically significant difference between this low, low group uh, occurred when the individual levels of resilience, those things, again, the, the, the environmental mastery, the optimism and so forth were high and they stayed high if uh, the environment supported the individual profile. So, the summary then of the population study uh, up, up to this date, and the studies continue, um, could be, um, the summary could be uh, outlined as follows, that the resilient census tracts, and this is background census level data, did indeed have uh, income inequality when you compare blacks to whites. Understand that data I'm presenting you is all on African-Americans, but income inequality existed uh, more prominently in um, the, uh, actually in the resistant tracks, I'm sorry, and this should read resistant tracks. People living in poverty were greater in number in those, um, in those um, risk, high risk tracks. Sorry for the typo. Um, respondents living in resilient tracks reported their neighborhoods to be more aesthetically pleasing, less violent, more access to healthy food. Residents of resilient tracts also had these individual characteristics that were uh, positive. And Life Simple 7 was associated with individual factors, neighborhood factors, and the individual factors carried greater weight. The second project in this ex exploration into this notion of resilience. Um, looks more clinically, something that more uh, cardiologists would probably be focused on. Um, and what we did was, again, go back into the neighborhoods and now bring in individuals from a variety of these neighborhoods and look at some fairly specific things. Within the limits of our funding, we uh, looked at um, measures of oxidative stress, inflammation, and regenerative capac uh, capacity, something that uh, our shed my partner in this uh, specializes in, as well as uh, looking at some non-invasive subclinical disease measures to see um, what the difference, what differences were between individuals coming from the at-risk and resilient environments, as well as uh, performing a small uh, intervention study that looked at whether or not we had, uh, we could affect change 
in any of these factors uh, that uh, uh, were uh, either more prominent in the, in the high-risk group um, or uh, blunted in the high-risk group. Here's some of the actual factors that are being measured. Um, C-reactive protein, uh, plasma cysteine, uh, glutathione, and you can see the list. Some of the vascular measures included uh, pulse wave velocity, um, uh, augmentation index, and CIMT, and all of the markers were adjusted for life cycle seven score. And this just is a brief illustration of some of the vascular measures. So this data is still early, and what um, has emerged already, which looks extremely familiar if you were listening earlier, and that is that uh, activity with neighbors and, and social cohesion emerge as significant neighborhood resilience characteristics in individuals who have favorable um, arterial stiffness measures. Um, and among the psychosocial personal resilience characteristics, purpose in life was, was the, the one that emerged most prominently, and the only one really to achieve uh, statistical significance. Again, interesting observations and maybe clues into um, uh, how people who live under adverse circumstances uh, societally and even um, a, a very, a very locally to their local common everyday experience, people who are going through that, how they might avoid some of the challenges uh, that emerge for African-Americans more generally. Taking this to a different population, we went back to my, my old group in Jackson and uh, applied some similar analyses and found very similar results. The final project that is still underway to look at uh, the possibilities or the indications of resilience in the midst of adversity um, are um, focused on the, um, the epigenetic level. And uh, in this context, and by epigenetic, I'm referring to microRNA analyses and also um, looking at some uh, um, metabolome-wide scanning. Why would we look there? Well, there are so many epigenomic modifiers that really could be tied back to um, social experiences uh, environmental exposures that might be quite different among African Americans, generally speaking again, versus their white counterparts. We know that, um, just speaking briefly, on um, th the concept of, for instance, of environmental racism, we know that African Americans tend to live in environments that are more polluted, closer to highways, <clears throat> and, um, and have other challenges. Um, a brief digression, I grew up, for instance, uh, in a part of uh, Birmingham where um, there was a, a black enclave um, that, um, as my father would tell the story, um, the, the, the vast forest behind us was intended to be a playground, according to the developers that he bought the house from. Um, four years later, a giant uh, plant that developed um, wire products was erected. Uh, it was noisy, uh, it was polluting, and it, it effectively ran all of the, the creatures from that forest into our homes, particularly, uh, I could tell you stories about the size of the, the rodents that uh, would uh, trip the, uh, the traps in the house in the middle of the night. Um, that type of thing is, is personal and individual and anecdotal, but it is part of a much larger story that happens not just in Birmingham or in that era, but has happened for generations around the country. So there are lots of reasons to think that epigenomic change would be important. I'll just summarize the preliminary findings and I, I'm sorry to leave you with preliminary work, but <laughs> it is clear already that um, we are finding distinct microRNA and metabolomic profiles for African-Americans who have low versus high cardiovascular health. Um, there are, there's also some early signals in the metabolite, uh, excuse me, the metabolomic work that um, point to 
uh, differences in high versus low uh, life sum seven scores that may again be tied back to this resilience concept. And <clears throat> getting both microRNA and metabolomic uh, information allows us to uh, construct these uh, networks, if you will, and look at um, the sort of a systems biology kind of thinking that will in, and hopefully enable the uh, development of robust biomarkers that will provide additional insight into risk and resilience. Some closing thoughts on this preliminary exploratory work. Again, cardiovascular health disparities negatively impacting Black health are real and should not be ignored, and uh, we have much work to do. While Blacks have, as a group have worse CV statistics, there is substantial intraracial heterogeneity. And this has importance, not only on a theoretical basis, but um, as I told my uh, instruct, the, 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 my mentees and uh, clinical people training under me that ultimately uh, it's, it's great to be aware of these group trends and, and group findings. But ultimately, the person in front of you is indeed an individual. And when it comes down to treatment, you do not treat the demographic, you treat a human being. And Blacks are often resilient in the face of biological and psychological adversity. And this is worth acknowledging and underscoring because um, quite frankly, um, the consistent drumbeat of uh, Black illness um, is itself in some ways not healthy. I think it is important to know, first of all, and to orient us as a research community and as a caring community, that indeed the story of the Black experience um, in the United States is ultimately one of survival and overcoming and, and getting to a place of uh, survival, overcoming, and even thriving, despite incredible odds. Now that doesn't step back away from the fact of disparities. Of course there are disparities. There should be, if you look at the record, if you look at what people have actually lived through, to not have disparities would be an astounding, uh, astounding uh, occurrence. It would be, um, an amazing uh, set of circumstances. But in fact, that's not what we see. We see heterogeneity and that heterogeneity is trying to tell us something. We have unfortunately for the last 400 years been conducting um, an unnatural natural experiment. And that is to uh, have a group of people easily identified go through a uniquely uh, toxic experience in many, many instances. Of course, there will be people who succumb to those toxicities, but I think there's something to be understood and appreciated and learned by getting a deeper understanding of those who somehow do not succumb. Individual and contextual resilience factors overlap and reinforce each other and can act in concert to promote health. Acknowledging and exploring black heterogeneity and resilience, and this applies to other groups as well. This may offer new insights and expand our approaches to the resolution of disparities. And I think it may give us some important fundamental advances in understanding how humans do it, how we overcome adversity, whatever it is, how we withstand not just psychological and environmental challenges, but biological challenges. This is an area as worthy of intense focus as is our current and traditional focus on disease, death, disability. The symbol of the rose breaking through the concrete is at the bottom of this, um, this group of pictures. And I was drawn to it. Some of those, some of you may be old enough to remember uh, Aretha Franklin singing about a rose in Spanish Harlem. Some of you who uh, may be older uh, may know that Benny Hill before her, I think originally recorded that song. And even Tupac Shakur had a version of the rose through the concrete. 
life for African Americans can be as hard as Congress. This is a historical and present day fact. Environmental challenges have biological consequences. This is scientific fact. The fact that despite tremendous challenge, there are African-Americans who look like the people in these pictures, who are long lived, who uh, have overcome um, multiple levels of adversity and who are thriving. They have as much to teach us as those that we traditionally focus on who have succumbed to the challenges of life as it exists um, in America today and in the past. Our hope, obviously, is to resolve all of those social um, ills that contribute to poor health and health differentials. In the meantime, I think it's important for us to um, learn as much as we can about the survivors, um, because unfortunately, social change um, is a glacial kind of event, and sometimes it can turn on the face of elections and other uh, political determinants. Coping with the current circumstance is important and there are people who have successfully done it and they can teach us much. Thank you very much and I'm open for questions. Thank you, Herman, for a, for a, a, a really uh, inspiring talk. Um, you know, I'd just like to start out by, by um, congratulating Herman for, for not only recognizing um, uh, problems, but, but acting like a scientist and, and, and asking some questions, asking some questions that maybe didn't occur to other people or occurred to other people and weren't pursued. And then, then doing the hard work of, of getting the data, interpreting it and, and drawing conclusions. It's, it's, a, it's a great example for, for all of us. Um, we have a a couple of questions in the Q&A already. Um, first from Chinanso Opara, one of our fellows. Good morning, Dr. Taylor. What role may faith-based organizations or participation in them uh, have in resilience in your findings? You know, I, it's an important question that um, we have not pursued specifically in this work, but it is on the table. Um, you know, there, there's some, um, there's some work out there that's getting a little old now, uh, and there may be people in the audience who can update me, but um, suggesting, for instance, that um, church going as an index of, uh, of uh, participation in, in uh, faith-based organizations and an index of spirituality, that church going um, in African, well, yes, in, uh, among white Americans, um, is associated with a seven year increase in longevity. A church going in black Americans is, in, is associated with a 14 year increase in uh, longevity. Uh, black preachers I've talked about this data say that's because uh, everyone should go to a black church. Now you, you have to take that and uh, use that information as you will. I think though what it points to is um, what's at the, at the heart of your question, that uh, that type of um, spirituality, um, the uh, perhaps if we were trying to dissect out what parts are most potent, maybe uh, you might focus on the, the social cohesion and activity with others, uh, types of uh, positive uh, that uh, derives from uh, church going. Um, perhaps it's on a higher level. Um, it's certainly not the church dinners, we know that. Um, but it's an important, uh, again, signal that, um, you know, the multifactorial, the, the presumptive multifactorial uh, cluster of uh, attributes, habits of mind, habits of body, uh, approaches to life that contribute to resilience despite adversity um, needs to be uh, more deeply explored and um, 
potentially apply. Thank you. Our next, next question is from an anonymous attendee. <clears throat> I've seen work where black health is compared to white health and a goal of improving black health to the index of white health. What is a better way to calibrate improvement in black health in non-resilient populations rather than to compare it to white thresholds? Right. <laughs> a beautiful question, beautiful question. Um, in fact, we know that um, on a global uh, level, white health in America uh, is, is not that great, right? Um, as a standard, um, it, the bar is uh, lower than it, than it should be, um, you know, at least on the, the longevity scale. We're somewhere in the middle of the pack and uh, we do disappointingly well for uh, rich countries. We certainly don't get our money's worth as a nation because our health should be much better if it was indexed to the amount of money we spend. Um, I agree with the spirit of the question that we don't know uh, what the ideal uh, is. We don't know what the, the golden uh, target should be. Uh, but I, I think uh, looking at resilience um, and uh, my focus is African-Americans, but looking at resilience as a human phenomenon is something that uh, bears a lot of attention, that warrants a lot of attention and may get to uh, the question that you're raising, just what is our potential for good cardiovascular and other health? Thank you. For our next question is from Jill Steiner, one of our um, uh, early career faculty. Thank you for an excellent presentation about this important work demonstrating these links between cardiovascular disease, physical health, and social so, psychosocial factors related to resilience at the population level and within pertinent social constructs is necessary for developing interventions that actually address disparities, really speaks to the importance of involving community and reaching people where they are outside the vacuum of medicine. I guess that's a more of a comment than a, than, than a question. You, you, you have any, uh, a brief reaction to that? Because we have I, questions. Yeah, well, a brief reaction is I agree with you 100%. <laughs> okay. Um, from Christy Hepner, uh, thank you, Dr. Taylor, for sharing your fantastic research. I was curious if you are exploring future research that implements interventions that may enhance social co cohesion and activity with neighbors to see if this results in improved cardiovascular health in at-risk communities. That's actually a question that occurred to me also, the, the mm -hmm. issue of, of interventions now that we're starting to see um, some cause and effect. Right, uh, great question. Um, and again, um, we are um, planning to do just that. Um, it is a multidisciplinary undertaking. Um, as as indicated by the fact that we had three groups of uh, scientists focused on different aspects of the problem, we are uh, planning to come together to uh, devise uh, interventions. Um, th there was an intervention embedded in Mecca, and we're, we're uh, beginning to look at the data there, which was uh, basically uh, a web-based uh, uh, self-guided versus guided with a coach uh, intervention that that really looked specifically at um, intervention uh, on the traditional behaviorally based risk factors, and that that data looks positive. It looks positive on two fronts: one, that uh, such an intervention actually can improve um, life simple seven scores, and that it can be done in this case um, uh, being driven by the automated interaction and, and not necessarily augmented by having uh, the cost and investment of a human coach going alongside that. So that's important to pay attention to. It was a small intervention. We're gonna look at it hopefully with uh, funding, look at it on a larger scale. But to your point about uh, the, sort of the social types of intervention, I think that's a very important front. You know, how do you improve um, social cohesion? How do you improve uh, activities with neighbors? Some things come to mind, you know, the, the church uh, was brought up earlier. Um, you know, there are other centers like schools and so forth within neighborhoods that can be sites uh, that facilitate greater uh, social interaction 
and activities with neighbors. Um, and there are others that the social scientists I, I know would probably rattle off uh, much more easily than I can right now. But what one thing does concern me though, and that is um, the, this points very directly at the impact of gentrification, right? Um, if indeed social cohesion and activities with neighbors are good things, what happens in gentrification needs to be very, very carefully managed, monitored, and addressed. Because the you know, what happens sort of uh, spontaneously is that people colonize. People come in and you know they have what they you know what their values are, what they want to see happen to the neighborhood, and that that may or may not be part of what. The, the traditional residents of the neighborhood may value, right? Um, you know, there are you know, you know, there are positives and negatives to improving the uh, the value, the economic value of, of sectors of of the inner city. Um, however, um, we have to be attentive to the potentially destructive impact um, of gentrification, in particular, as it erodes. Um, activities with neighbors and social cohesion. It, it, you know, people know, and I, I hope no one is offended by this, but people know that, um, you know, the, the first uh, sort of phalanx of people moving into a, a traditionally black neighborhood in, around Atlanta, um, that um, it, it is expected that the people moving in will find common ground, uh, that, they will often be well armed. Um, they will uh, often have large, uh, large dogs with them. Right now, these things are what people talk about when you talk to community members uh, about the changes in their neighborhood that they that they are fearing and that, that they're concerned about. You know that impression of you know sort of the alien coming in and, and colonizing what used to be a black neighborhood. Those things have to be worked with and changed and managed. You know, uh, the economic pressures will continue to be that people are moving back into uh, the, the, the inner city where the infrastructure is good and where access is good. Um, we just have to balance somehow that imperative against what's healthy for uh, people in the neighborhood. Well, on that on that um, optimistic note, um, I, I'd like to thank Dr. Taylor for for his time and his insights, and congratulate him on his work. Um, I know he's uh, been generous uh, to devote some time to meet with uh, people throughout the day today, uh, and uh, uh, I thank the the questioners and um, uh, everybody who attended this morning. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone.